right. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, using CT and the role of CT uh, in particular for imaging for TAVI. Now, when you think about what TAVI involves, it's uh, someone standing about a metre away from the aortic valve, putting a wire up through an artery with a bit of uh, porcine pericardium on a spring. We're usually doing this in someone who might be 100 years old with lots of comorbidities. So the question is, what could possibly go wrong? And I think we all know that, in fact, there's quite a lot of things that can go wrong. And the point that I'm trying to make is that imaging is key to mitigating those risks. So we can have annular rupture or pseudoaneurysm formation. Uh, we really don't want to have a, a post-operative uh, x-ray that, that looks like this, although it may not be a total disaster. And of course, as Greg mentioned, paravalvular leak is very significant in terms of the long-term prognosis. So imaging is key to uh, reducing those risks. And we, we know that uh, there are not risks just within the heart, but risks such as stroke and pacemaker requirements and vascular complications that we also need to try to reduce. And sometimes these risks can all be interrelated. Now, you've seen this picture a lot, but a lot of what we're trying to establish is about this uh, annulus, this virtual basal ring uniting the hinge points in a single plane. And measuring that ring uh, that, that, and that annular structure, as well as other, other elements, is really key. And as Greg mentioned, when, uh, when we started with TAVA, we were really looking at using 2D measurements from transthoracic and transesophageal echo. Uh, but it's very hard to be sure that we're measuring a, the true uh, dimensions uh, with a two-dimensional echocardiography. Now, 3D echo is certainly much better. There are centres such as uh, King's College Hospital in London which predominantly use 3D uh, TOE as their uh, modality for sizing the, the annulus. But it's fair to say that it's actually quite difficult and it requires a lot of experience, particularly in the situation which is the usual situation where there's a lot of calcification. Again, um, we've looked at using MRI to have a look at the valves and the structure. Uh, I have to say that MRI has not really taken off. Um, it, people don't often realise that when we have a, a nice MR image like this, it's usually a slab of minimum of three or four millimetres thick. And so again, when we're looking at very fine structures, it can be hard to use this kind of cine imaging. And the 3D MRI modalities are often affected by higher flow velocities and things like calcium. So uh, could there have been comparison studies uh, such as uh, Andrew Jabor who had a look at the differences in measurements and while they are compar comparable, um, there is significant differences between measurements between different modalities that we need to be aware of. So the advantages of CT are that we've got reasonable temporal resolution but we've got excellent spatial resolution. Also, it's an isotropic data set. So whereas with 3D uh, echo data, generally the pixels, the voxels that are further away from the transducer are larger. For CT, uh, it's uniform size and it makes it easier to reconstruct. Excellent tissue delineation. But the important thing is that we're not just looking at the annulus and the valves, but we can look at the whole vascular tree, which is very important. In terms of um, how the CT is done, there are lots of different protocols, but generally um, it'll be done in a sort of two-phase protocol where we use a ECG-gated protocol to look at the annulus and the valve so that we can look at a particular phase. And then there'll be a rapid acquisition of the vascular structures. So ideally it's done with a single contrast bolus. Sometimes it's still done in two phases, so two separate injections. Most of the time it can be done in a single contrast injection. And at the end of the day, we get a um, very motion-gated uh, image of the annulus and we get the whole vascular tree. Now, the reason why um, the ECG gating is important is because the uh, annulus is a very mobile structure. Right? So, we, so we need to remove that motion. And secondly, there is also important differences in terms of the size of the annulus that occurs during uh, the cardiac cycle. So generally, the annulus is larger in systole, so systolic uh, images are generally the most important. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, and, and there can be a sort of a fluctuation of, of around 5% or so between those systolic and diastolic phases. So having a range of phases is often preferable and being, having access to those systolic phases is, is important. Now, again, as being mentioned, we, we often talk about the diameter of the, of the annulus. But it's important to note that when we were looking at the diameter on CT as with 3D echo, we're not really looking at these measurements A and B diameter. So what we do is we work out an area or a perimeter and we derive a virtual diameter from those measurements. So you get the perimeter and you divide it by pi to get the <coughs> diameter um, or you use uh, the equation for the area of a circle pi r squared to work out what the diameter is from the area. And these are much more reliable ways of working out the diameter than just measuring this with, with calipers. And once we've got an established a diameter, we can have a look at these sort of standard sizing charts to, to determine what the best uh, valve is going to be. But again, we're not just looking at the diameters and the measurements. There are a lot of other factors that we need to take into account. Um, now, once we've established the annulus, uh, we can use that to work out a few things that can help us with the uh, procedure. So we, we can assign uh, points to the, the bottom uh, of the, the virtual annulus or the hinge points of the uh, valve. And we can then use that to help us with ideal uh, positioning of the fluoroscopy during the procedure. I have to say it doesn't work 100%. There's some differences between the positioning of the patient between the CT and the table, but it can be quite useful to, to guide where the starting position should be for your cranial and caudal angles. Now, as I mentioned, there are a lot of other factors that we need to look at to decide on the size of uh, a device and also what kind of risks we're looking at. So one thing is LVOT calcification. So heavy LVOT calcifications is associated with a higher risk of annular rupture. Um, and the amount of calcification on the aorta is also important. And we can look at this uh, sort of um, visually or semi-quantitatively, or you can do uh, like a calcium score using a standard kind of calcium score algorithm. And um, certainly if you've got a calcium score of more than 3,000, you've got a much higher risk of getting paravalvular leak, at least with a self-expanding valve. So again, these sort of considerations are quite important. The next thing that we need to measure in CT is the distance from the valve to the coronary ostea. So remember, when we put the valve, uh, the, per the um, catheter valve in here, these uh, native leaflets are going to be pushed upwards and there is a potential for obstructing the coronary ostea. <coughs> So you ideally want to have a relatively large distance and a big sinus rather than a small distance. The, um, again, you know, we've got a very dynamic um, motion of the, the annulus in relation to the, the uh, coronaries. Again, this is uh, taken from a 4D uh, CT. And um, so if you've got a very low coronary height, so 10, less than or equal to 10 millimetres is definitely a risk factor, though a significant proportion are greater than 12 millimetres. Female gender, small aortic sinuses, and then certain procedural things like valve in valve give you a much higher risk of these, these native leaflets causing coronary obstruction. And again, uh, there, there are um, interventional techniques which you can use to mitigate that risk during the procedure. So now we've had a look at the heart, and the next thing that we need to have a look at is vascular access. So vascular access complications, again, relatively common, particularly with the, the larger sheath sizes, though less, less critical now. Two things that we're looking at is one is obstruction, and second is sort of tortuosity. Uh, just as a, this is a fly-through, so if you were a little tavy going up into, uh, up into the aorta, this is what you would be experiencing. So you're going up through the ascending aorta now, we just went past the renals and going through the arch. And so you can have lots of uh, complications at, at any path along that way. So having a look at the vasculature, again, key for uh, TAVA procedure. And at the end, we would usually use a, a report or at least a, a worksheet that looks something like this. So we've worked out what the annular size is, the sinus heights, the sinotubular junctions, the distance to the coronary arteries, and measurements of the, you know, the ilex and femoral arteries as well as your, um, C, your recommended angles uh, for, for the CR. Now, um, unfortunately though, the role of CT doesn't stop there. 
So what's increasingly being recognised is that there are some late complications of TAVA that we need to have a look at. So this is um, like a flow simulation of um, flow through a TAVA device. And what's important is that whereas Levi early, earlier described that uh, retrograde flow that causes a sort of flushing motion across the valves, this is, seems to be relatively absent when you put in a TAVA. And as a consequence to that, um, so thrombosis or thrombotic material on the valve leaflets seems to be not uncommon in post-procedure. And it's a relatively common cause for some of these higher gradients. It's also being more uh, recognised even in surgical valve placements. But again, the tool that we generally use for looking at this is CT. So CT is an excellent way at looking for thrombosis of the TAVA post-procedure uh, and again used in research but also clinically if you're noticing increasing gradients. Um, what is uh, the future of TAVA measurement? I'm not sure if this is the future but one future is to use a, a CT to create a 3D data set. So this is done by a company here in FIOPS in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, we segment out the, uh, the calcium from the standard vessel, simulate the uh, valve uh, being inserted uh, we can uh, try to simulate what effect it will have on this calcium. And then finally, you could uh, have a look at it and, and simulate what happens with flow afterwards. So you could ask the computer, will I get a perfect result after this with no paravalvular leak? And the computer says no in this case. <laughs> so uh, so uh, and you can send this off to Belgium and get that answer. Thank you very much.